We're spending 22 minutes today with Kenny Loggins. <laughs> Sponsored by Fiddler on the Roof on Broadway. Tickets available at telecharge.com. We were lucky enough to get you because you're in New York to pick up a big award from the, Why Hunger, the Humanitarian the Award, Harry right? The Harry Humanitarian Award. Yeah. It's a, uh, an unexpected honor, and I appreciate it. And yeah. I'm working with uh, Why Hunger to uh, do their summer lunches program. I'm going to sort of be the spokesperson for that because there's like 18 million children who qualify, uh, 22 million children who mm -hmm. qualify for their lunch program and then 18 percent of that to actually carry on into the summer so they want to try and up that percentage right this is like the the meal meals rocks for Me, kids it, meals yeah. rock for yeah. kids right yeah, they all, they've always got to put rock in there somewhere yeah. it makes it <laughs> they cooler. do because of the man <laughs> um now uh, how did you get involved uh working for the why hunger charity? this is a brand new thing we just started talking to them uh got about a, two months ago when they asked if i would want to received the award and I thought well this let's work together on something so they told me about their lunch program that they were about to mm -hmm. launch and I I said I want to be involved right and I guess well, one of the other uh, rockers involved Tom Morello rage against the machine and oh yeah, yeah. It's just yeah. The, we're very similar we're like um, <laughs> our music exact yeah. same genre yeah. right yeah <laughs> did you know harry chapin at all before he, he died no i in never 75? met 75 you guys never no. your paths never crossed musically ironically no no but this is just such a great thing um, yeah. that you're doing for the charity and you've always been involved in children as you as uh, you well, say well i have five do, <laughs> you have five of your own right, right? yeah that, that's probably yeah. part of the reason why um and you have a new book out too for kids. Yeah, yeah. I, I um, talked with a, a friend of mine. I, I I had sung Frosty the Snowman for a publisher uh, for a book on that mm -hmm. uh, a couple years ago, and he called me and said, "What about rewriting Footloose to be a children's book?" And I thought about it. And I thought, well, I'll check with Dean. Dean Pitchford wrote the script and mm -hmm. everything, but. Dean was cool with it. He and I wrote yeah. the song together years ago. Right, right. And so I, I sat down to reinvent it, uh, the idea of being uh, animals in a zoo mm -hmm. and the zookeeper, uh, whose name is Jack. Get mm -hmm. back, come on before we cry. Jack opens the, at the full moon, he opens the cages and lets the animals all out so they can dance under the full oh. moon. Oh. And there's two little kids that kind of sneak into the zoo and watch the whole thing. So it all just sort of poured out. Oh, that's and, cute. And it's lots of animals, great illustrations. Um, it, I'm very excited about it. it kids, kids love that idea of an adventure, like after yeah. dark. Yeah, after dark. Free, right yeah. On. <laughs> the things that happen. Yeah, I kind of like the great. idea. What, what age group is it aimed at? Um, I think probably two to seven, somewhere in there. Yeah. 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 It's a good question. I should ask. <laughs> <laughs> and and the song, of course. Um, was Oscar nominated it won song of the year yeah. the Grammy um, and you say that was a collaboration you you co-wrote had you seen part of the movie before you wrote Footloose or had you been working on the song well, prior and it became Dean, that song? Dean came to me with a screenplay mm -hmm. uh, Dean and I had written lyrics together uh, for some of my own tunes in mm -hmm. on my records right. and so he came to me with a screenplay and said you know read my screenplay and tell me what you think and in those days, getting a screenplay from a friend in L.A., that's not uncommon. The cab driver hands you one as you're oh. getting out the cab. <laughs> so it's like, okay, I'll, I'll check out your screenplay. And it, I read it, and it wasn't Gone with the Wind, but it was Footloose. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, let's sit down and write. And he wanted to write a song with me so that he would not only be the screenwriter, but he would also be the collaborator on the music. And that would help him open the door. So as a favor to Dean... I wrote Footloose and Heaven Helps the Man, uh, right. two songs right. that ended up being a favor to me. Mm -hmm. did, did you ever think that that movie would become, well, first of all, such a box uh, office no, smash? No, we had no idea. You know, it, I think one of the reasons it worked was because the music was written before they filmed it. Mm -hmm. So the dancing that was done was done to the real music. Oh, you know, okay. in Hollywood, music is usually the last, the bastard stepchild of, of <laughs> movies. And, and so... To bring the music in early meant they weren't just doing this on camera. You know, they were right. actually dancing to the real groove and the real song. Right. And I think that's why the, the movie works on that level.
Right, and you also did I'm All Right for Caddyshack. Was that the same kind of thing? You had an idea what the storyline no, was no, going Caddyshack to be? How did that was, one work? Caddyshack was the opposite. I went hmm. to see a screening. They didn't have an ending on it yet. Uh, but I went to see a screening of what they had, and I laughed my ass off. It was, it was <laughs> hilarious. And I wanted to write everything for the movie. I had never mm. written for a movie before, so that was exciting. How did you come up with I'm All Right? Was there some, some particular scene or some Rodney yeah. Dangerfield thing well, that inspired there's you? A thing, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a thing that directors do where they'll put in what's called temp music. Mm -hmm. and, and so you watch a, a screening with the idea of the kind of music they want in that section. And in the opening of the movie, they had a Dylan song. Mm -hmm. So I assessed that what they were after was this, this kid was kind of a rebel at heart, mm -hmm. and they wanted to present him as a sort of uh, a, a rebellious character who would stand up to authority eventually, but mm -hmm. he doesn't do it for quite a while. Right. So I'm All Right came from the idea of, uh, you know, just kind of, I'm all right, getting that kind of Dylan-y thing and that attitude to it, and that just came out of that. With all respect to Dylan, I think your your version works a whole lot better for that movie. It was such a well, it was such a funny movie, as you, you say. Yeah, it's, it's what we get used to. Yeah, and then of course uh, Top Gun. We were talking about this mm -hmm. on on Facebook earlier. Thirtieth anniversary yeah. today. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. You didn't write that one. That was that it's was co-written. That it was, was co-written. Co mm -hmm. It was started by Giorgio Moroder and his uh, lyricist. Mm -hmm. And um, they brought me in at the last minute. Actually, I, I wasn't the first guy that was supposed to sing that song. Who was? Do you know? Well, the, the way I heard it uh, was that it was supposed to be Toto. And oh. the, lo the lawyers messed up the deal, and Toto dropped out. Although I did talk to Steve Lukather a couple years ago, and he didn't think that was true, but urban legend. So, uh, <laughs> so the, they dropped out of the project. And um, I got a call from Giorgio's office. Giorgio called me and said, I need a singer. I got to dub this song in tomorrow. What are you doing? I was down the street working on a song I'd written called Playing With The Boys. Okay. So I just I asked him one question. I said, is it up tempo? Because mm -hmm. I'd been writing nothing but ballads, and I needed a rocker for my show. <laughs> and he assured me it was a rocker, so I w went in, worked on the writing of the tune, and then went in and, and sang it with Giorgio. Did you like being the king of the movie soundtrack at the time? Is it, was it fun? Were you well, happy about that? I'll tell that? you why I was happy about it, because disco had just come in and was destroying everyone's careers. <laughs> And I would have gone down in flames with everybody else if it hadn't been for the movies. In they, the late 70s, yeah, early 80s. Early yeah. 80s. Yeah. You know, Footloose was, or I, I think, um, when, when was Caddyshack? That must have been late 70s. Caddyshack was very late 70s. Yeah, because Footloose came in right behind that. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and um, that, that was a departure. Uh, obviously, the, the danger zone from your from your '70s sound. Right. Your work with uh, Jim Messina had been the the mellow rock. Tell us a little bit about how you guys got together. Um, I've read that you <clears> were the <throat> accidental duo. <laughs> that it was Clive Davis who drew the line and said, "No, you guys, you, you know, he's not just going to be sitting in on on the recording mm -hmm. of your record. You should be a duo." Well, that very that's very true. Actually, mm. I had gone to Jimmy Messina to make a solo record, and he was producing my record. Uh, the, he had produced uh, Buffalo Springfield last time around, and then he, he produced uh, the Poco records as well as being in the band, so he had cred credentials, and I wanted to work with that. And in the process of working up my first solo album, he started showing me some of his tunes, and I thought they were great, so we started working up his tunes, and it just instantly became a duo. Right. He came up with the idea of sitting in being like the old jazz records, where two different musicians would sit in on each other's record for, mm -hmm. for a one-record thing. And then when Clive heard it, he said, no way am I releasing a record of a band that's going to break up. <laughs> so he made us commit to uh, six, six years. 
What was it, though, when you first started working with him? You know, you, you listen to people who, when their bands get together, they sometimes say it was just, uh, mm -hmm. there was just such a, a chemistry that, 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 that they just yeah. knew right away that this was going to be a great thing. Was it like that for You're you guys? You're making me want to say no, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, there was, uh, there was. That was a, awful. Yeah, no, the, we didn't actually <laughs> sing at the same time. We, <laughs> no, uh, there was definitely a chemistry. And, you know, I was a kid from Ohio. Amber. I'd never made a record. Uh, I'd written a lot of stuff, but you know, I'd never actually done anything but a few demos. So here was a, a seasoned vet in my eyes. Mm -hmm. He was one month older than me, so he was my senior. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> we, and so I kind of went, you know, show me what you got. What do I do? He taught me how to find a manager, how to get an agent, how to get a record deal. You know, we already had the whole Clive thing sewed up. Right. So I just kind of paid attention. I went to school on it. So he was a, a mentor? I in would say sense? he was a mentor in yeah. that way. I learned a lot about the business and then when I went solo in 76, mm -hmm. um, I had learned a lot about putting a band together and rehearsing, getting ready for the studio and I just carried on with that. Yeah. Was your split amicable when you guys parted ways? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. yeah. I think Jimmy was going through a tough time because his, his marriage was breaking up at the same time and so the have the band break up was it was harder on him. Mm -hmm. But I was super ready and I was excited to move into a new direction. That sent me into Celebrate Me Home, which was a completely different right. musical direction. And a record that immediately went platinum so you were it got no good reviews it <laughs> absolutely no, seriously zero, it got no good zero reviews. good reviews what was the criticism it wasn't Loggins and Messina oh. you know, people reviewers don't take well to change but it wasn't a different it wasn't a departure in terms of style so much was it oh, celebrate absolutely. me home absolutely yeah no it was it, I moved into more of a smooth jazzy kind of oh, thing okay. I was working with Bob James and mm -hmm. David Foster writing with keyboard guys uh, using chords that were just not cool in Nashville. So it didn't get good reviews, but people yeah. went and bought the record in droves. E eventually. Yeah. <laughs> and Celebrate Me Home became like a, a, a yeah. homecoming anthem for well, people, yeah, right? It was years later, actually, yeah. that it became this adopted wow. as a Christmas song. Wow. You know, and we, I tried writing Christmas songs. The, the dream of a songwriter is to have a copyright that's a Christmas song that shows up every year. And like Felice so Navidad kind of thing? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'd written a few of those that never really caught on, but Celebrate Me Home did. Right. I have to ask you about, Dan, back to the Loggins and Messina uh, mm -hmm. days, Danny's song. I just think it's such a great uh, story, and that is yeah. one of those songs that people, I think, still listen to, even if you've heard it a hundred times. You can't yeah. help but get misty-eyed. It's just so beautiful. And yeah. that was written um, based on a letter that your brother had written you That's about right. the birth of his my, child? My big brother wrote, wrote to me uh, after his child was born. And a, a number of the lines in the song are directly from his letter. The astrology uh, thing? Pisces, Virgo, rising, okay. and uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, a, a lot of that. I can't remember what, mm. oh, the whole uh, uh, fraternity line that no one ever hears anymore. Seems as though a month ago I was beta oh, right. chi. Right. That whole right. thing. There was a lot of stuff from the letter in the, in the and song. And you took that letter and essentially turned it into art, and what, what was your brother saying like, oh, Hey man, I didn't think we we're going to share the letter with everybody. Yeah, right. what, what was no, that he was, like? He was totally cool with it, you know. And you know, it was an act of love from his little brother. Sure. Embarrassing, probably. And and the boy for whom it was written was he aware of that growing up? Like when he would hear that song on the radio? Years like, later. Years yeah, later. I, I don't know. He and I have never actually talked about that. I wonder how embarrassing it was for him. Not embarrassing. <laughs> like, I mean, it'd be nice. Well, no, you know, Christopher <laughs> Milne, you know, who was Christopher Robin. Mm -hmm felt like he lived under the tyranny of the Winnie the Pooh books his whole life. Hmm. You know, it's not necessarily a great thing to, to have that character. kind of, to be a character in a, in a book oh. or a song. Now, that was actually, that charted, right, when Anne Murray recorded it, right? Right, right. Yeah. Anne Murray had the hit on yeah. it. We never did. Now, is that weird when somebody else, and you've written, you've written this yeah. song, you have this gorgeous version of it and then you hear it on the radio and 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 she's charting with it or, oh, or are you just happy? It's not weird, it's exciting. It's wonderful? Yeah, it's fantastic mm. and she did a great job on mm. it. And then after she did that, I showed her a song called Love Song. I want to yes, sing you a love song. Yeah. And she loved that so she followed Danny's song with Love Song and did just as well. Wow. So in the 70s, you're a part of a 
an amazing pop duo, like the pop duo of the 70s. The 80s, you're collaborating with different people, and you're, mm. how, does, how does a person's life change when you, when you start having that kind of fame and success in the music business? Uh, there's, there's many ways, but the first way it changed was that uh, I was playing a show in, in, in Berkeley, and a friend of mine showed up who was a race car driver. And I said, if you could have any car, what would you have? And now I have to, backstory, I was living in a half a duplex in East LA paying $65 a month with a dirt driveway. And he said to me, well, if I could have any car, I'd have a BMW three liter coupe. So I called up my business manager, which is something I just learned how to do. Mm -hmm. And I called her up <laughs> and I said, get me a BMW three liter coupe. She found one in Arizona had it driven back to East LA, and I had this silver three liter coupe parked in the dirt driveway of a $65 a month house. <laughs> and uh, that was the beginning of things spiraling out of control. But, but really, uh, I, to this day, it's my favorite car. And, you know, so things do change, you know, financially. Um, I never got, well, I don't know, I guess that's relative. I was gonna say I never got too carried away with it, but I probably did. I would think it would be tough not to. Yeah. <laughs> and then the success continued into the 80s. And then um, did you come to collaborate with Stevie Nicks because you, you opened for Fleetwood yeah, Mac at I, one point? I opened for Fleetwood mm -hmm. Mac at the beginning of the rumors ride. Mm -hmm. And so we started in smaller rooms. And before you know it, I was opening in arenas. And, mm -hmm. you know, and what was interesting, I was just telling a friend of mine, not long before that, I long as a Messina, we played a show with Peter Frampton opening, Fleetwood Mac after him, Loggins and Messina, and Rod Stewart closed. Oh my gosh. So, you know, that was in a Coliseum environment. Wow. So, you know, it's funny how things, you know, change yeah. so quickly. I That's... just I just played Daryl's house with Daryl Hall. Ah. And Hall and Oates opened for me. And in about an hour and a half, I was opening for them. Wow. So you get you get used to that. The, the one you pre I was going to say the one you previously mentioned was a, yeah. a, a Palooza before there before there was such a thing. Yeah. And and you mentioned uh, Hall and Oates. You know, I kind of think they. It sounds like they they um, obviously a very successful duo in the '80s. Right. And not too long ago, I noticed a, a new channel popping up on the radio, Yacht Rock. Oh really? That They're calling this is, it yacht yeah, rock. Yeah, and wow. that's and they, you know, it's like you guys and yeah. Hall and Oates, Michael McDonald, kind well, of that, thing. It's that term that started on the internet, mm -hmm. um, but it's a term that embraces <coughs> the period of, of pop music where we sort of channeled into a kind of smooth jazz kind of thing. Mm -hmm. When I made Celebrate Me Home, Bob James came into my life, who's a jazz pianist. Mm -hmm. And, and he started Foreplay, which is one of the biggest jazz groups in history. But at that time, smooth jazz was basically just emerging as a concept. And so I was working with Dave Sanborn and, and a number of really great players, the Brecker Brothers. Mm -hmm. And um, the music sort of evolved. David Foster was writing kind of an R&B thing. He wrote After the Love is Gone. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were moving into that area. So smooth jazz or, or uh, yacht rock it covers everything from that where smooth jazz merged with pop to where R and B merged with pop. Mm -hmm. and, and Holland Oates, of course, was the Philly sound version of that. Right, right. And uh, it, it was a fun ride. It's kind of coming back in the window a little bit. Yeah, I've, I've been I've been yeah. hearing it and hearing that 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 buzz phrase, you know. Yeah. Um, is that the secret to success uh, as an artist? Getting being, incredibly lucky? Being, <laughs> yeah, that's the secret. I tell it has nothing to do with it, being able to write a song. <laughs> well, it helps a little. <laughs> but it is that part of, the, part of the secret to success, to be able to shift into a different sound and a, and a different genre of music and to con constantly I, I reinvent say, yourself, yeah. not to sound too cliche. No, but, it's right. I think it's the secret to longevity. <clears throat> but, you know, I took a lot of heat for it at first because my record company wanted me to hold still. But I was a moving target. I did Footloose, and the next record I made was a sort of jazzy R&B record, and they were really pissed at me <laughs> because they wanted Footloose part two, three, and four. Right. And I couldn't bring myself to do it. I, I just kept... Sh the problem was I had two big brothers, and one big brother raised me on folk and country. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And the other big brother was deep into R&B and rock and roll. So he turned me on to Hound Dog by Elvis Presley, on into <laughs> Little Richard and the Coasters, the Dell Vikings, uh, you know, on it. And so he, he took me in that area. So as a kid, I'm seven years old and I'm hearing all this stuff and I'm absorbing it like a cradle language. So for me, musically, I can go one way or the other, like uh, Blue Sky Riders we were talking Just about, my, the band that. I started yeah. six years ago in Nashville, mm -hmm. uh, is kind of a country rock band. I'm sort of back to where I started with Jimmy. Right. And, but I just wrote a song with Thundercat, who won the uh, Hip Hop uh, Producer of the Year Award uh, uh, by producing Kendrick Lamar. So Thundercat and Mike McDonald and I just wrote a song with him, and he just asked us to sing on it. Oh. So I'll be heading over that way for a while. You're still working with Michael McDonald. Yeah, every now and then. Oh, that's great. And the country genre, doing something new. And obviously you've collaborated with so many different people, worked in, in different styles. Is there somebody that you wish that you had gotten the chance to work with that you haven't, that you haven't worked with yet? Um, well, not really. I mean, there are great writers, you know, like Paul Simon or James Taylor, mm -hmm. um, that I would have loved to try and, you know, see where the styles would go to, but they don't really collaborate. They, they haven't done that, mm -hmm. if ever. Mm -hmm. Paul, I don't know if Paul's really collaborated much. Mm -hmm. You know, um, times change, things change. Um, the... The collaborations that have happened and are happening are the right guys. I tried to collaborate with Todd Rundgren. Oh. And I flew all the way to Hawaii to collaborate with him. And, and he warned me. He said, I'm not very good at that. <laughs> and we sat together for eight hours and talked about everything but music, but the, the song that I wanted to work on. And we never really did get anything. Nothing except, happened? But uh, I think we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's yeah. nice, I suppose. Yeah. I would have liked to have hear, heard some music come out of that. I would have too, yeah. yeah. Yeah, And how about, how about Jim Messina? Now, you guys have, you have toured before together in, in we the did recent a past. We did a couple yeah. reunion tours, uh, yeah. 05 and then 12. Yeah. And um, we keep flirting with the idea, but he's into other things and I've got so much going on with the children's music now and the new, the Nashville band and sort of like I'm not sure it's I'm not sure if I want to go back into Loggins and Messina except that those moments when you want to do some serious reminiscing and kind of reconnect for a moment and then head back into your present tense life. Right so how can we see you in concert or, or can we in the near future or not for a while? Well not for a while mm -hmm. um I don't have much, I didn't really come prepared to plug any, I only have a few private shows coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a couple of public shows and I know my webmaster's going to kill me for not knowing when they are. <laughs> but, well, we can always check the website. I, yeah. I looked, I didn't see anything, anything uh, current, but yeah. uh, well, we look forward to it whenever it happens. Well, thank you. Yeah, Kenny Loggins, so what a pleasure to have you here. Thank you thank so much. Thank you.